lecture is identifying and analyzing clashes by me. That, that's my name. So some caveats. I was asked to make this lecture for intermediate debaters, whatever that means. I know what a beginner debater is, and I know what an advanced debater is, but I'm not so sure what the middle means. So I just took that to mean you generally know how to argue. You've been to like one competition or two or a few. You know how to rebut to some degree. And so you're looking at times where, for some reason, you just can't guess, get the motion right, or for some reason, you're opening government and you just don't know how to attack a motion. It's too broad, or maybe you're closing and you don't know how to enter. It seems like all the clashes have been already defined and there's no way for you to enter. So um, we're kind of in that in-between, that liminal space where it's not really sure how you can progress. And the point of this lecture is to kind of give avenues for you to, I guess, up the rigor of your analysis or just generally improve the way that you tackle debates. Also, this lecture will be mostly rules of thumb as opposed to hard rules. In most cases, I will justify the logic behind why a certain practice is preferable for clashing in a certain way or deciding clashes in a certain way. Sometimes the rules will be hard, and in those instances, I'll point out when. Um, they, I would generally be citing like the world's manual or other instances like that, or just like you know common logic for why this is a hard rule and should emerge as such. Notably, though, this is kind of centered around you know 2021. Like if you're watching this in the future, the rules may not apply. Like in 2027, we may have all agreed by consensus that opposition can just have infinite fiat. I don't know why we would decide that, but that's a possibility. And who knows what the future holds? So uh, just keep in mind that things may have changed um, from now than when you may be consuming this piece of media. So. Let's motivate the lecture. Why do we care about analyzing and identifying clashes? The first is that if you're off clash, you're very likely to lose. This is just assuming that everyone else is on clash. Like most of the time, since debates are comparative, um, judging is comparative, you might be lucky and the other team just clashes worse or does worse. But broadly, if you're off clash, you're very likely to lose a round because clashing determines how relevant your arguments will be to the motion at hand. Clashing strategically, when done well, can make debating easier and more fun. So you would generally like to, debate, to have debates to be more fun. And knowing how to predict clashes can make winning from opening a lock. And also just if you're judging, you have to be able to identify the clashes. Otherwise, you're just kind of looking at arguments. You don't know how to group them together. It'll be really hassle for you to write down everything at once. Um, so it's really just a nice mental framework to assess debates and also just make life easier for you. But also just because when somebody says clash and like you're off clash or we have two clashes in this round and you don't know what that means, don't worry, we've all been in that position. So this is about also kind of discussing the definition of clashes and using them for your own benefit and for profit, I don't know. So definition, this is a fairly lengthy slide and that's just because I suck at making PowerPoints. What definition of clash we'll be using? Since definitions will differ and people will use words differently, um, that's just how life is. But the precise definition we will be using is for government teams, so whether it be BP and opening government and closing government or Asians or WSDC, affirmative bench. This is just generally the real clash. I mean, all right, the recording's back on, solid. Okay, so the definition of clash we're using for gov or affirmative is just the kind, the, the reason why you support the motion and for op, the precise reason or disagreement or group of reasons or disagreements you have with the motion. You might use this interchangeably with stance or burden or issues. You might say in your speech, I have two issues to discuss this round. You might say there were two clashes in this round and I will resolve both of them to win for closing government or closing opposition. No one cares. I don't care either. Um, but in this particular instance, we will use these particular definitions of clash to discuss and analyze them. You can generally, as a judge or as a debater, identify a clash in a round by the broad themes being discussed in a debate. So a clash is not, is not exactly the same with an argument. You may have arguments, perhaps one per clash, but the precise definition of a clash is distinct from an argument in that you can use clashes to group together both government and opposition arguments, but also differing government arguments within the same case. Number. Okay. In many cases, judges use clashes to determine the persuasiveness of your case, but not just your clash, everyone else's clash as well. Because it would be kind of, it would kind of be like a dumb one-sided debate if you went up and spoke and you're like, our clash is human rights. And then they bring up other things, but the judge is like, I was really persuaded by this one thing. That was the clash I decided this debate on. And since they won it, they win the round. You would be mad, I would be mad, everyone would be mad. So that's not how things go. 
And generally, clashes are comparative because teams want to introduce benefits. And typically, motions aren't perfectly balanced in all different clashes. Some clashes may be winning for one team, and some clashes may be winning for another team. And teams may gravitate towards particular arguments in particular clashes. So just a note, it may be unclear whether or not you are allowed to take a different clash from your opening. So we're debating on a different topic from your opening. Um, let's clear this up right now. From the world's judging manual, proposing a different metric by which the debate should be evaluated does not usually constitute a knife. So it's not a knife to say that X thing is more important than Y thing. So your closing government, you support X thing. Opening government supports Y thing. Just because opening government says Y thing is the most important thing in the round doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. So that's something you can contradict them on. But you cannot contradict them if you are saying things that are directly contradicting things they said to prove why thing. Does this make sense? So you can contradict the prioritization of issues in the round or the meta debate, but you cannot contradict the actual facts or statements they've claimed. What does this mean? Here's an example. If you have, for example, an opening government that says, we have X conclusion, and that arises because we use our money in this way. If you are a closing team and you say, we have Y conclusion, we, we will use our money in a different way from opening government, even if theoretically, these might be both plausibly achievable under the motion, because the money is being used already, it is a contradiction to say that your money will be used in a different way. If you can reach it without using perhaps that same amount of money, then it would not be a contradiction to achieve that clash. Thus, and we're kind of using math major language here because I was on a, I had like three math subjects last semester. So I'm kind of in, used in, in that kind of frame of thinking. If in the proving of X thing, you make claims that are contradictory to claims about Y thing, then you are knifing. If you are not doing that, and you're making a separate non-contradictory clash, then it's valid. Okay, having cleared that up, so this isn't just important for debaters, when you're thinking of an extension, and you're worried that you're going to knife. Um, also for judges, if a team says the thing is most important, that doesn't count as a contradiction if a, the closing team says this other thing is more important. That's just how debate works. Like. If that was true, if that was plausible, then an opening government team could just say, don't believe anything closing government says, they're all liars. And then closing government says anything, you would be forced to not believe that. So at some point, closing government does have to contradict opening government. Okay, let's illustrate something about this. So we're gonna do something um, which is just analyzing the truth value of a statement, right? So it seems obvious at first to just say, oh, we're just supporting the motion. But there are parts where it gets thorny because it is not necessarily clear. Ooh, am I lagging? Oh, somebody just direct message me. I'll answer this later. Um, you can also direct message me if you're shy to send questions in the open. I mean, we all get that way sometimes. So um, let's say the motion is this house would something. It's a long statement. The example we're using is this house would big red ball. The statement you are proving that you are trying to do, since it's this house would, so it's a policy, you're trying to do big red ball, whatever that means. For government, you have to support that it is a big red ball. Opposition simply has to not support the policy. What does this mean? They can choose to be not a big red ball, which is contradicting the entire statement, or if you split big red ball into a series of sub-statements, it is big, it is red, it is a ball, then even if you only contradict one of the statements, that is still untrue, as in it is still contradicting the motion. So you can say, for example, the ball is red and ball, but it's not big. You can say it's not red, but it's a big ball. Or you can say it's not a ball, but it's big and red. Um, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because there will be sometimes motion set that are very unintuitive because it seems like you have to oppose everything in the motion, when in reality, you only have to op oppose a little bit. So for example, if you have a motion like this house would, I recall this being put somewhere in Hello Motions. There was a motion about allocating art funding randomly based on artists who had art that was sufficiently distinguishable from a five-year-old's from the perspective of the average reasonable person, which is a really weird burden. You're like telling the Gov team to defend like two or three things, but you'll hit these motions sometimes because some people just set these times. First to say we will give no funding because I would be tired if it's the Gov team saying something's very important about art. So you have to defend some form of funding. And you're also not forced to defend selective funding. You're not forced to defend the worst possible version of funding because 
in some instances, you have the ability of fiat, but in other instances, you can simply disagree with a part of the motion. And so long as it makes you can disagree with a part of the motion, as long as you're disagreeing with you know, some part of the motion. Um, that's just because that's how mathematical, like that's mathematically how truth value works, right? Like if the, the statement is X and Y and Z, using the logical kind of connector and, the statement is only true if X, Y, and Z are all true. So if one of them is untrue, then the entire statement is untrue. Okay. <laughs> Internet. Okay. Now, obviously, this is sometimes kind of a kind of a dumb move because, especially as a judge, sometimes I just you know it's not fun to see these things. It can look really soft. It can look really bad for a team. It looks like you're really badly doing it. Uh, I was on a hell of motions example, but I'll just skip it. It takes too long. Um, it may look really bad. Um, my personal opinion is that if you're only objecting to one part of the motion and it is feasible to object to other parts of the motion, then you should object to more. This is because if you're only objecting to one part of the motion, it is very easy for the government team to defend it because you're only really doing one thing. So they're only forced to defend one thing. And that means that they can let the rest of the debate recurse on itself because they've proven the rest of their burden. So typically, as an opposition team, you want to broaden the responsibility of the government team to defend. So for example, if you have a motion like this house believes that X policy is illegitimate and bad for the poor, if you're government bench and you only say this house believes that X policy is illegitimate, but it's good for the poor, then you've lost the round because you're not defending the motion. You're only defending one part of it. Similarly, if government does their job and say it's illegitimate and bad for the poor and op says oh, this motion, we don't care how legitimate it is, but we think it's really, really good for the poor. Then all government has to do is spend seven minutes in response saying why it is quite bad for the poor, responding to their material, which makes their lives easier. Okay. All right, so I got to carry on. Um, but before that, someone asked what knifing means. Knifing basically means you're contradicting your opening. It's the, I don't know where it came from in terms of debate jargon, but I guess it kind of like stems from like, Etymology of like you're backstabbing someone who you thought was your who, the, who you're supposed to be on the same team as I don't know British parliamentary. Okay, now we will note in, in this kind of definition that there are some instances where your disagreement with the motion is not yet immediately visible from the motion. So you still have to prove a clash, as in because the clash relies on something to be proven in order for you to believe it. This is true for all clashes, right? Because obviously, if you're gonna claim a policy is unjust or bad or you know kills more people than not, then at some point you have to prove that in the argument, which obviously is true for any analytical point in the debate. But it is true for some claims, uh, grammar error on the PowerPoint, more than others. So for example, if your strategy is to clash by saying a policy is an overreaction in the sense that it overshoots its goal, and there are many adjacent policies or social forces already in play that achieve this goal in other ways, then you have to prove these policies exist, and then you have to prove it's an overreaction. Similarly, if your clash relies on a counterfactual, which I think is actually the most version, common version of this error, if the motion is like, this house regrets a thing, and then your government and you're saying, we regret this thing because the alternative that would have happened is so much better for reasons X, Y, Z, then you have to explain why the alternative that arises actually arises. And it's ambiguous to me whether or not this is part of the clash or part of the argument. But in any case, when this happens, when the argument kind of mixes with kind of the reason you're disputing the motion, pay close attention because these are foundational premises. And if you can prove or disprove these premises, then uh, so if you can disprove these premises, it will be obviously immensely damaging to the persuasiveness of the case. And this is one of the places where you should strike. If you're the team trying to prove these things, and sometimes you just have to, because sometimes it's just a more effective strategy, or sometimes the impacts in this particular clash are higher, then you just have to be very careful. And a uh, personal example, in, uh, in the, 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 we, when we were OG in the world final, and we were really worried that opposition was going to like say, the leave, the countries that you, the countries in the WHO will not join this court and will leave. We were really worried about that. So we were like, here are nine reasons why they'll stay. 
and, and it didn't obviously it didn't work because they came up with another way to rebut us and we lost. But that's kind of some of the stuff you have to think about, which is how will other teams criticize you, get really worried about that, and then start preemptively defending the clash. Because if your clash is awry or they can prove the clash is off kilter or off clash, then you, you've lost the motion, basically. Okay. How do you identify existing clashes in the round? Um, so this is just kind of uh, generally anything a team argues is part of a clash, but we're really just more carefully, precisely defining this as what clashes do we care about, right? Like, let's say you argue some kind of dumb case about nuclear war happening because of like, oh, you put this tax on people that get really mad and somehow that leads to nuclear war. I mean, it's unlikely, if especially if you do a bad job of proving it for a judge to credit it. Um, in some cases, you'll get boxed out, but you really are in the right. Those instances are reasonably rare. Um, but in those cases, then stick to your guns. But generally, especially if you're a closing speaker or you're a judge, you can identify the clashes in the debate by looking at, first, what teams explicitly agree on. Second, what teams implicitly agree on. So even if they don't say it outright, if their argument is, we care about the economy because we care about people not starving, and the other side is like, we care about, oh, we care about human rights because we care about people not getting shot and arbitrarily detained, then in general, they care about which side is better for people, right? And that's something people implicitly agree on. Um, thirdly and lastly is personal intuition, because there will just be some instances where nobody agrees, and that will suck, but it'll come up eventually. And in those instances, you want to be just, all right, what does a person like in this situation? If you're a judge, like this is, at some point, I think the judge manual says it, or I think uh, it's in one of the videos they had where you have like, at some point, you just have to be like, what would the average reasonable person defer to or what clash or what subgroupings they would have in the round? Okay, so I know it's a bit vague, um, but in a round, I think it will become clear as teams go, I agree with what opening opposition said, um, but we think we achieve it better in closing government. And then they run their case. And, and in those instances, you'll see, okay, that's the clash. That's how they're deciding to enter the debate. Okay, let's go into the more debatey part of it, which is how do you select the clash? Um, and there are three broad ways, or rather not ways, because you will have to do all of them if you want to do it well. Um, three broad things to think about when selecting a clash. The first depends on the motion. The second depends on the persuasiveness of the material inside. And the third depends on the clash of the other team. Let's get into it. First, the clash you can select depends on the motion type because the motion type imposes constraints on the way that you can dispute or support the motion. Some of them are obvious. For this house would, do the thing or don't do the thing. If it's this house believes that, the statement that you're believing is true or untrue. Then we get into the bit more meaty ones. I don't know why I use the word meaty, but we're already here. So this house prefers, if your opposition, and it's just this house prefers, there's no alternative suggested in the motion, then you cannot clash by saying, instead of doing this, we would have done this because you're forced to defend the status quo unless an alternative is explicitly stated, in which case you cannot defend the status quo. You have to defend the alternative proposed in the prefers. So if this house prefers a world that started from communism instead of capitalism, uh, like in the, in the ancient times or whatever, I think that was also a motion on hella motions, but I forget. Um, you can't, as opposition say, we won't have communism or capitalism. We'll have anarcho-syndicalism or whatever, right? And then you, you can't obviously do that because that's neither of the things presented. A note I forgot to put here is that you also, in this house prefers that motions, you cannot clash by saying, we think there are transitional harms. I don't know why. That's just how the world manual says, and it's a hard rule, so you can't do that. For this house prefers that motions. So if you're, if you're saying, oh, the harm is that in the transition to like a communism, people in the past will end up dying in, in bloody wars. That's not part of it because I don't know why, but it's just not part of it. I think uh, you may want to check me here on the world's manual. I may just be wrong um, or may have been like gone, had like temporary hallucinations when reading it, but that's uh, generally my memory. Okay, next type of motion. This house regrets. You're forced to defend a retrospective on what had happened, which is essentially asking, whether or not the world would have been a better place without the existence of the thing being regretted, which just implies you don't have fiat to say how it would have turned out alternatively. That is to say, without the thing being regretted, you don't have fiat to say, oh, people would have done this and people would have done that. You have to prove it, which essentially means you have to do 
analysis, which is kind of where the thing I mentioned earlier happens, which is sometimes the clash will be contingent on you proving first that the clash is valid and plausible to happen. The last thing, and this kind of deals with our stuff most neatly, this house supports or this house opposes motions. Um, this one's a bit of a weird one. Since I remember, remember if I said earlier, oh, sometimes you can be selective with how you clash. You can clash big or you can clash with it being red or you can clash with it being a ball. But you cannot do that in this house supports or this house opposes motions. Um, the reason for that is um, if you have a motion like this house supports US involvement in the Middle East, and I'm just reading from the world's manual here, government teams have to argue that the thing is positive in its totality without saying particular aspects of the motion are good or bad. And similarly, opposition cannot do the same with just picking and choosing what to oppose. So you have to oppose the whole shebang. You can't do part of it. You can't just say, um, it's only we only care about the good stuff if it's big or it's red or so on. So generally, this house supports, this house opposes, forwards or requires you to advance some form of supporting and some form of, of form of opposing for the entire motion, not just kind of like in the abstract, not just as a value judgment, but also not just the thing that you want to defend, but other things as well. Um, I think we had an example for this, which was like, this house supports the secular, oh, wait, no, that's an example I'll use later. Um, never mind. it'll be an example. Okay, where am I now? There we go. So now that we've discussed how motion types constrain your examples, let's go to the persuasiveness. So you want to pick clashes also on the persuasiveness of the material within. So in some debates, a clash based on a fundamental violation of your human rights will be more effective than others. Sometimes it will be very ineffective and so on. So you want to forecast the kind of material you can run within a clash. That is, if you're going to broadly claim this is bad because it makes people worse off, you're going to have to explain these four things. The first is you want to look at the ease of response. Um, basically, this just entails you asking yourself, if I were the other team, could I have a quick response to make it look stupid or and so on like could i could i make this look dumb could i disprove this quite easily if i were the other team if you can easily think of a response or perhaps your teammate can easily think of a response you're in a bit of a pickle um moreover it's not just that you don't want to stop there sometimes there will be just like five minutes of me and my partner going in prep saying okay what if they say this let me say this oh but what if they say this when we say this ben will say this and that'll be kind of a response chain what you want to do is you want to forecast the end of that response chain as fast as possible by looking at the most reasonable responses that you could give to the responses that they give, to the responses that you give, and so on and so forth. And then the one that wins at the end of it, if you're the one that wins at the end of it because you are the one that has the last response, then you should probably pick it because it means that Gov doesn't, the other team doesn't have a good enough response to your last response. Essentially, what I'm saying is pick arguments that are hard to rebut. Secondly, you also want to pick material that is generalizable. You don't want to pick material that can just be marginalized to a very small set of people or a very small set of circumstances because you generally want things to be likely because the less likely they are, the less likely they are to be credited by the judge. That's some wordplay. Notice what I did there. So you want to pick material that can be proven to be happening quite often or perhaps the harms already happened and you want to prove that it is some... I think the buzzword here is like structural. You want to prove that it is inherent to the motion that you're doing because if it just coincidentally happens a lot with the motion but isn't inherent to it, it'll be a lot easier for the other team to disprove. So you want to prove something is likely and you want to do that by proving it is general. Third, you also just want to check if it's provable, right? Like you, if you're in a motion about like this house supports the legalization of marijuana, you cannot, I mean, maybe you could, I mean, if you're like a god, but most humans cannot prove within seven minutes that this will lead to nuclear war. And I know this sounds like a dumb thing. Like, of course, I'll pick an argument that's provable. But a lot of people fall in love with an extension because of the fact that they've seen this run before in a similar debate, despite the fact that the material might not be analogous, perhaps because it's a different motion type or because there's a different wording in the motion. So you always have to check, are there reasons I can run to prove this without looking like an idiot? And fourthly, lastly, impact. Even if you are the best debater. If your arguments have no impact, I mean, what can you really do? Um, I think one of the examples here was, there was a world's round about, it was a gamer motion, basically. And I was so hyped. I was so pumped because, you know, I'm a gamer. I can't believe I just said that. 
and that's being recorded. But I play, I play lots of video games. I love video games, right? And we were very certain about the argument that we ran. And we were like, okay, we'll prove this. We'll prove that um, people enjoy games less. And we proved it. It was true. Nobody disputed the truth value of it all too much. The problem was just it wasn't as important as the arguments being run by ran by other teams, which like people were experiencing like harassment in games. Their their like lives were being ruined and stuff. And and then and we just lost because I mean, if you think about it, right? Like I mean, you can enjoy a game less. You can just move to another game. It's not really that impactful. Um, so you always have to think about not just your argument, but also the place and positioning that argument has in changing the lives of actors that you're trying to defend or interacting with the other arguments of other teams. So you generally want to run material that um, ranks highly on all four criteria. So it, you want it to be hard to respond to, you want it to be generalizable, you want it to be provable, and you want it to be impactful. Um, I know this sounds like I'm asking a lot, but the thing is, most of you are already doing this, um, or at least to some degree, right? Because Im implicitly, you are pairing away arguments that you cannot prove, right? If you were in a debate about lethal autonomous robots, you would not prove that like this would improve, um, I don't know, food security in the third world, right? Like it'll be, I, I, it might be reasonably hard to prove. Actually, wait, no, it's kind of possible to prove because you could say it extends conflict. Okay, let's pick a more outlandish one, nuclear war again, right? So this like attacks on, on junk food would not lead to nuclear war. And that's pretty hard to prove. You're already implicitly discarding it. And it seems obvious to you, but you need to hone these senses and I guess maybe think deeply about whether or not this is something you can actually prove, perhaps by forecasting what kind of proofs you could run for a particular claim, or even just asking your partner, like passing it through like the, the test, like, do you think this looks stupid? I don't think it looks stupid. So maybe we should run it. Okay, there's that. Briefly, let's first ask how to call out a bad clash because I know that some of you are thinking, oh, I've, I've faced a team that's really garbage um, and they had a really wrong clash, but they just forced it and then they won. Um, the first thing to note is that having a bad clash is not something a judge can penalize you for. One, because there's no penalty judging and debating, but two, because it's not bad if it works, right? So you can't just say a clash is bad and expect to win. You have to use the fact that a bad clash is bad and something that can be damaging to a case line. And Obviously, clashes will differ based on how bad they are, but there are three stock responses that you can use to kind of ease the analytical load on all those responsive speakers out there. The first is the truthfulness of the claim or dispute. You can just ask, is this true? Is this really going to happen? Um, and if the answer is an easy no, then you should say why it's an easy no. So you should first start with the easiest level to take, at, to take a look at, which is it doesn't happen. The second is mutual exclusivity. There have been very many rounds where a team rambles on about why a thing is bad or good. And the only real response I have for this is, I guess, but it's not like you change it. And then they're like, oh yeah, and then we win the round. And you always have to pay attention to whether or not the concern they have with the motion is something that is only present on your side. And this happens a lot with motions like this house forgets the rise of something or the glorification of something because it doesn't actually change the thing. So many people will rally against the thing itself, like the glorification of motherhood. People are like, motherhood is so oppressive. It is terrible, which is you know, probably true in some cases, right? And the other team just responds, yes, but you're not against motherhood. You're against the glorification of it. People are still going to be mothers on your side. And then the judge is like, wow, that team is so smart. And then the initial team that said that case line explodes because they're so angry that they got rebutted like that. So you absolutely have to make sure that your material is mission exclusive. Lastly, you also just want to do the relative importance of the claim, which is, just, is, it, is this true that this concern outweighs the clash brought up by other teams? You don't even have to look at what other teams will clash. You just have to think about, if I say this, will I look stupid for saying it's more important than something another team could plausibly say? Like, is it really, will I really be able to defend the gamer's enjoyment over like people's lives literally being destroyed? Maybe not, right? So think about how relatively important the claim is. And we're all prone to these sometimes because we all get you know, a little bit lazy, a little bit relaxed and, and self-assured in our own abilities. So you just have to make sure that you're doing it right. And you have to make sure that you're checking all the, tech uh, checking all the boxes. Okay. Um, don't worry, um, the two people that asked me earlier about those questions, uh, I will just talk about them uh, in a bit. They're not really directly related to anything here. So I'll take a bit, I'll talk about them later. So the first thing you want to ask is, what do you do if you're off clash? The first thing you do is you panic. I mean, if you're off clash, you've made a mistake. Like, 
absorb the fact that you've made a mistake and internalize not doing it again in the future. Typically, the best way to, to not be off clash is to learn from your mistakes in the past. And the best way to recover from being off clash is to not have done it in the first place. So panic. Let, let it sink in that you've made a big mistake. But secondly, ask yourself if you really are off clash. Sometimes teams will just accuse you of being wrong with looking at the motion when they're wrong. And then you're like, okay, you're wrong. I got to defend myself. To be clear, it's not always obvious whether or not you are really on clash. Sometimes it may be ambiguous. And so it's not enough for you to just say they're clearly wrong. We're off. We're on clash. We're not off clash or whatever the term you want to use. Because you still have to defend and justify that to the judge because a judge cannot immediately take your claims at face value even if they really want to. So you have to do things like, one, check the wording of the motion and tell the judge, look, this is the wording of the motion. You know, By rules, the motion has to be interpreted in this way. Two, you can look at the burdens they've taken on as a team and say it would be unfair for them to take this really light burden and then they're expecting us to like solve racism, right? So you have to pay attention, but more than pay attention to whether or not you are off flash, you have to... If in the case where you are on clash and they're lying or they're wrong, you have to be the one to point it out because they're not going to point it out. So someone's got to do it. And that, point, that person's got to be you. Lastly, let's say you are off clash, engage. You just engage with what they're saying. Engage with their harms. Try and get their harms. Try and co-opt. Try and mitigate their benefit. Try and make sure that you're still in the round. Because just because you're off clash doesn't mean it's impossible to win the round. Um, but moreover, um, debating is always still comparative, right? They, may have, they might have argued their side badly, and so it might still be possible for you to recover. But the most important thing is after you're done panicking, never lose hope because hope is the, you know, the number one resource in debating. It's not time, even though time is really cool. It's whether or not you're still willing to fight back against another team and make sure that you're still on track to win the round. Um, so engage. And obviously by engaging, rebut, try and mitigate what they're saying, um, outweigh it, and so on. Okay. How do you know if you've won the clash? Which is a hard question, right? I mean, sometimes, like, I mean, judges can spend 30 minutes on a call and still feel like they're wrong. Sometimes debaters can come out of a round not knowing who won, despite having debated for like a bajillion years, right? So it's not an easy question to answer. But generally, and I'm saying generally with like a grain of salt, you can work backwards from the core of the clash and examine the truthfulness of the different claims used to prove subclaims, examine the subclaims to those subclaims, and so on until you've reached basically everything mentioned in the clash. This is because it's really not so easy. Like sometimes you just have to get dirty in the details. That's a weird way of saying it. Um, and just say, look, they're trying to prove that a statement is true. They're trying to prove that this thing is unjust. Well, how do they claim it's unjust? First, they claim it's unjust because it's, I don't know, it's theft. Then they claim it's unjust because it's coercion. Okay, how do we know that it's actually theft? Well, they first gave an intuition pump, an example. Was this intuition pump rejected? No, maybe it's true because it also seems reasonably intuitive. Okay, so we can believe it's theft. Is believing it's theft enough to believe that it is unjust? Maybe. Do I believe their justification? Yes, and so on and so forth. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not like saying this is true in all cases. I'm just saying in this hypothetical round we've constructed ex nihilo, you have to examine each and every subclaim and check whether or not it's true, which is why writing notes is very important for the debaters. So for example, if the motion is something like this house supports the creation of lethal autonomous robots, there will be instances where there are claims from both teams that are true. And so it's not possible to just say everything they've said is true, everything you've said is untrue, therefore we win. Because you will typically not be so lucky to oh, outmatch a debater so hard that you've proven, disproven literally every claim they've made. Like you would have to be debating like a salad or something to, to, to have that happen. But there will be sometimes standing claims from both teams within a given clash. So let's say you prove it's unjust because it's theft, but you don't prove it's coercion. Let's say they prove it's just because of the fact that, um, I don't know, let's give an example. Maybe they prove it's just because it creates more utility. So from a utilitarian perspective, it's more just. Um, how do you resolve these things? You want to recurse to weighing metrics. If you're a debater and you still have time to speak, you want to weigh it. If you're a judge, you can use the other weighing materials used by teams in the round, or you can, in the worst case, when nobody's literally nobody's weighed, then you obviously you're forced to step in and resolve it at some point. Uh, or you can just call it the deadlock and then not resolve it. Um, and then recur recurse to other issues. Um, 
Here's an example of that happening. So if the motion is something like this house supports the creation of lethal autonomous robots, the clash is who saves more lives. And within this clash, your standing claim, I did not finish writing this sentence. I'll just say it out loud. Within this clash, your standing claim is that killing people effectively saves more lives and lethal autonomous robots kill people more effectively. Obviously it saves more lives because the war ends quicker, less people die of starvation, and that's good. Opposition's argument is, oh no, but lethal autonomous robots are too effective at killing. And since they kill people faster, they kill more people. Who wins this clash? You're likely to win this clash because the way your material interacts with their material disproves the link that material has to the conclusion that they have, where they're assuming that killing people effectively and quicker leads to more people getting killed. But since you've already claimed that even if you kill people slowly, there will still be lots of other people dying due to ancillary effects of the war, such as starvation, then you can prove that you've won this clash even if there's no direct response, because you can also look at how claims interact with one another. So you see what I mean that this is kind of complicated, right? Claims will have different characteristics. Some of them will directly respond. Some of them won't directly respond, but they will outframe one another and so on. So you have to look at really every claim individually. So in this instance, we would say you won because you explained that killing people effectively is a good thing for saving people's lives, even if what well, opposition says is true. Okay, so that's how you know if you've won the clash, which is, it's really hard, but you got to look at everything. Um, okay, let's put this analysis to the test and let's go over a few examples. So y'all can just say your thoughts in the chat or message me privately. Um, I don't really care, but let's, we're going to go over three examples and then just kind of gauge how much people have taken from it. And then I'll explain things. So the motion, let's say, the hypothetical motion is this how supports the rise of language generating AI. Gov runs that language generating AI is very good and the rise makes it better. There are two possible clashes you've thought of. The first is that both the language generating AI and the rise is bad. And secondly, oh, you know, and secondly, the rise is bad. Which clash is preferable? If you think it's the first one, write one in chat. If you think it's the second one, write two in chat. Uh, I don't know. If you don't have an opinion, write three. Um, you can just say it whenever you want. Um, I'm just, I mean, I'm. Mm, 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 mm. Come on, come on, come on. All right, I've, I've gained a sufficient glut of answers. It seems like people have peer pressured one another into writing two. Um, I think it's two. I personally think it's two. So I agree with most of you, but I don't think it's clear cut. But the reason why most people would say it's two is because if you think about it, language generating AI doesn't go away on either team's side, right? Your side will have language generating AI because you're not supporting or opposing language generating AI. You're supporting or opposing the rise of it. And government is saying they're supporting the rise of it and so on, right? So it's entirely plausible for OP to run a case line saying, we actually agree that language generating AI is good. We're not conceding anything in the motion because nothing says we have to defend that being good or bad. But we think the rise makes it worse because the rise makes people more reckless in doing it, creates or race to the bottom, and so on and so forth, right? You can just like, maybe you can say, it's so quick, it happens so quickly that so many people lose their jobs and the economy doesn't recover. If it's slower, we can implement policies to regulate it more quickly. And so it's less immune to regulatory capture or more immune, whichever modifier is appropriate. So that's what the, what's, that's the rational I'd use on second. But it's not clear cut because if you say that, there's a way for government to get around it. And I've actually been hit by this before. I was so confident that I was like, the rise is good, but the rise is, they say the, the thing is good, but the rise is the thing that they have to regret. And we think the rise is bad. What, what the other team said in response to me was, the existence of this thing would never have happened without the rise because it required a massive amount of initial startup capital because it is very research heavy, which means that it doesn't have immediate returns. Um, and it required like public support because people were initially against or hesitant to do things like support AI. Um, which means that if you agree that language generating AI is good, then you must support the rise because it would not have existed otherwise. So that's one way you could defend one. I don't think it is the truest thing in this particular motion because I think at the end of the response chain that eventually loses. But I think it's one valid way in general of tackling rise motions and other motions like glorification, which is that it would have never happened. It is contingent perhaps entirely on this other part of the motion. So 
But to be clear, I think most of you are right, but that's just my personal opinion. Things may change in the future. So second, let's take the motion, this house regrets the industrial revolution. Is it on clash for opposition to run an argument that states due to the industrial revolution, uh, sorry, that states that, not that states, that states that due to the industrial revolution, technology will get even better going into the future. And then they impact this by saying, oh, the better technology is, the happier people are, the more access they have to like information and, and so on. Um, yeah, so if you think it is an on clash, then you say yes. If you think it is off clash and invalid for them to run and Gov should call them out, you say no. You can also private message me. You can also tell me I'm handsome in private messages if you want, but that's kind of weird and please don't do that. Actually, it'll be okay. I'm actually, mm, I don't know why I mentioned this. Maybe just don't. Yeah, that'll be better. Okay, I'm getting some no's and uh, a few, a uh, yes or two. Um, okay, so let's just head it off at the pass here. It's a bit of a hard question, but the actual answer is yes, it is on Clash. Think about it like this. It is possible for you to say things in the past have an effect on the future, right? If I stub my toe really badly, then in the future, I will have to go to the hospital. And one of the reasons I can regret stubbing my toe now is that in the future, I'll have to go to the hospital. Uh, to the person that messaged me, yes, I did lose this final. Um, so it is possible to stub your toe and, and, and regret something that will happen because of what might cause it into the future. Um, I think we're a bit fixated on you can only analyze what happened in the past, um, which is partially true. You can only claim to change what happened in the past. So the only thing that changes is the lack of existence of that thing in the past. But what you can change is potentially its effects in the past, but also its effects in the future. So to think, of, think about it like this, if it was impossible or off clash for you to make this claim, then you would only be able to claim the benefits of regrets motions up until the exact present. Now, there are obviously concerns with running arguments this way, right? If you're saying, oh, technology is guaranteed to get better in the future, that's uncertain. You have to prove that. And you have to do quite a lot of work to prove that technology might get better. It's possible for opposition to say, for government to say, oh no, things won't get any better because we're in a state of persistent decline. Corporations have incentive to do things like planned obsolescence maybe, or maybe we'll run out of resources. So at some point, technological development would stop and we lose out on gaining efficiency. Um, or maybe we reach this economy to scale. So it is not, off clash for the for gov for op to run this argument. However, it is not necessarily optimal, and there are ways to get around it. However, I think in this particular motion, it might be good because there's I mean there's a lot of future like the future might go into infinity, so there's a lot of room for you to argue benefits there. Anyway, that's just something to think about for regress motions. Lastly, let's say you have a motion. This house opposes the secularization of philosophy. Gov runs that the secularization of philosophy is bad because there are many instances of rabid atheists of acting to alienate religious people from philosophical thought. And then they impact that by saying, philosophical thought is good for X, Y, Z reason. And obviously we want people to have as much access to this as possible. Opposition's response is that while this might be bad, they can choose to support the good parts of the secularization of philosophy and shouldn't be forced to defend only the bad parts of it. Is this response on clash? Uh, you can just say yes or no again. I appreciate everybody who bravely, bravely messages in chat. You know, it's the braveness to, to believe that you might be wrong, but still answer in the name of discourse in you know, popular discussion. I believe in all of you, you know? So if you, if you chat, you have my uh, fervent approval, I guess. Thanks. All right. So I'll just say it now. Um, part of the response is on clash and part of it is off clash. Um, but I would say no, because obviously, if part of it is untrue, then the entire thing broadly is untrue, even if the other part of it might be true. Why is it off clash? Well, even if it is true that they shouldn't be forced to defend only the bad parts, it is untrue that they can choose to defend only the good parts as well. What does this imply? This implies that just because your government team is wrong at a clash doesn't mean that you can also be wrong at a clash. I mean, 
two wrongs don't make a right. Also, two, three rights may make a left, I think is the joke, how it goes, or four, whatever. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that just because you're not forced to defend the bad parts of it, uh, just because... Um, Rather, just because you have to defend the good parts of it doesn't mean you're not forced to defend the bad parts of it. The best way to respond to this would be, first of all, obviously to refute it, to say, no, this didn't happen. Like the worst possible version of this is like Richard Dawkins and even he wasn't that bad. And then the second thing to do would be to outweigh it, to say there are far more good secular people who are trying to get people into philosophy and they were initially kicked out of philosophy because they didn't like it and it was religious and they had bad ties to religion. Therefore, our actor group and our good parts are more important than the bad parts that you dispute in the motion. So that's how you would resolve it. That's also ideally how I think it should be done. Obviously, that's a personal opinion again. Um, but generally, I find that to be more logical of, of tackling it because not only does it meet the, the constrictions we put for what a class should be and you know this house opposes and so on, um, it's also just more logically sound because it takes down you know the benefit that they give, assuming it's true. Because remember, the more engaging you are with the opponent, the more likely a judge is to believe you. And obviously you want the judge to be persuaded. Part of being persuaded is at some point not conceding, but assuming some things in order to get ground into debate. Okay, that's the end of all my prepared material, I believe. I'm clicking, but there's no change. So I'm, I'm hoping that means that past David um, has only prepared this much and I'm not skipping over some material accidentally. So now we're free to have some questions, but to cap it off, to cap it all off, um, generally you clash with your dispute or main disagreement with the motion, and you can organize arguments within those clashes. Um, you may have more than one clash, and generally you can contradict your uh, the prioritization of a clash, but not the content within a clash when it comes to your opening team. You want to select clashes based on the motion type, based on how good the arguments and re responses are within that clash, and what other teams may say. And we're putting that to the test here because we're trying to examine how a clash affects what you can run. And if you clash by saying we don't disagree with what they've said, but we think they're still bad for the rest of the debate for this reason, then you can invalidate many of the arguments, which is why it's important to select clashes based on all these three criteria. And then you know various other important things like how do you call out a bad clash and so on. Okay, now I'll be answering kind of this backlog of questions um, and you're free to send some questions in chat as well, but we're nearing the end of the session. Thanks for staying and ostensibly not being so bored to leave out of disgust. Okay. Does it mean that if you are making any case supporting the motion, it's a clash? Well, yes. I mean, generally, a case is a reason to support the motion, right? But you can group cases into a broader clash. So if you have the first case being, this is bad for the economy, and the second case being, this is bad for stability, it makes the place more conflict-ridden, then you can both group them broadly under, we want less people to die, whether it be from starvation or from violence. So not necessarily but generally, yes. Sometimes you have fiat and sometimes you can disagree. Oh, that's just, um, let's see. someone's just recounting to me the last words I said. Thank you, kind citizen. Okay, is the following motion retrospective? I'll copy paste this motion so everyone can see it. The motion that this person sent to me is this house prefers a world where human beings perceive each other as inherently malicious over inherently benevolent. I don't believe so um, for the reason that it's not implicitly or explicitly asking us to talk about the past. It's also this house regrets. And generally, this house prefers asks us to look at the comparative that we've kind of set up. Also, I think that might be a more interesting debate. Like, oh, societies would never have formed if people viewed each other as evil. And therefore, since they would never have formed, we would never have gotten access to many of these large benefits. That's really cool. I think that's a cool argument, actually. Hmm. Um, might be cooler, but I don't think so. Um, you can turn off the recording if you want. I mean, if you want to store these questions as well, that's also fine. But I'm not going to add anything else. I'm not going to talk about the PowerPoint anymore, unless people have questions about it. All right, we're recording. Okay. Sometimes in the debates about narratives, side which opposes the narrative, uh, the side which opposes the narrative says that their world is better because people on their side, because on their side, people are to choose how they should behave, jump into a traditional role model or be more specific. And that on another side, society is just forced by the narrative. Is it okay or not? Oh, I think I get what you mean. Where sometimes teams will go, their side has to defend this narrative, but our side lets people choose between narratives. Um, to which I would say, the first is it kind of depends on the wording of the motion. If the wording of the motion just implies one side gets to choose between things and the other side is forced, obviously that's the burden that's imposed on you. But I typically don't, 
I think that's a bit of a that's a bit lopsided in many instances. So in 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 an instance where you're forced to defend it, you can say what well, one the choice is bad. Two, you can say the consequences on a broader scale are bad because even if the individual choice is good, there are some people who can't make that choice in either side of the world. Hello, am I still here? Just checking because my phone is almost about to turn off. So I'm just checking if my if I'm still heard. Can someone just affirm that I'm heard? Solid. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. All right, you can stop saying yes. Um, um, where was I? Yes. So you can you can just run responses saying having the choice itself is bad. But usually I don't buy those responses. I think those are like debate world responses. I think they work and they're sometimes true, but I also just think sometimes they don't make sense. So I think what you can do is also just impose the same burden on them. If they're supporting the choice, the, the choice, the choice to do our thing, then they're implicitly supporting that our thing is good because its presence, whether or not you actually take it, is good for the people. However, if you're on the other side of it and you're forced to say it's bad, you should stick with status quo, it might just be good for you to defend that status quo already has a multiplicity of alternatives for people to select from. Having one more adds very little. And when people do opt into it, it doesn't really, it's quite bad for people. Okay. On that note, for first motions, which point of view are we arguing from? Like the idea of society of humanity or progress is so vague. I agree. It's quite vague. Um, this is kind of what we have to deal with. Um, I don't have the world manual on me and off the top of my head, I don't think there's any particular thing being stipulated aside from the general operate from a third party perspective, no particular inclinations towards any ethnic group or societal group, um, just that generally the team that persuades you the most wins. Um, so you're not really forced to defend a particular idea of society, um, especially if the arguments might even go against it. So it's really just the default third party perspective, I think, is for third party motion, uh, prefers motions. Okay, we are getting more stuff. No worries. Um, in terms of prioritization, at times not letting go of subclasses and grouping takes a toll on me. How can one get clear as you have tons of material being pushed around and no matter what we rebut, something stays non-respondent at large? Are you a judge or are you a debater? Um, okay. Someone's asking, what are the best ways of going out of the utilitarian bubble when running the principal clash is the only one option? It's very rare that you're only forced to defend the principle. I guess there are some debates where it's like, oh, you're forced to defend an authoritarian, sexist, regressive, entrenched society that is terrible and everybody hates it. Um, and you really have to clash on the principle. I guess one way you could do it is by explaining how the principle, running intuitions on when the principle overrides the utilitarianism. Um, and there are plenty, there are very many intuition pumps you can, I think there's a, there are, I think two separate, very good videos on this. The first is by Doug Cochrane. I'm no, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's on YouTube as well. Eight ways to break the utilitarian bubble. And there's also a lecture by Ashish Kumar on very shiny principles and how to run them well. I don't know if it's usual. I think most motions have, like most motions do not force or entail like a hard principled stance without any practical recourse. Typically you will have some practical material to run as well to fight back. Okay. Uh, okay, go eat dinner. Um, I hope you enjoy dinner. Um, debater. Okay, so yes, if you sometimes, if you don't let go of unimportant subclasses, you, your material prioritization will really suffer. So you just want to ask yourself as a debater, if this gets through, will the judge make me lose? You can let go of the nuclear war cases. You can let go of the stuff that's unimportant. But um, if they have a claim that's pretty good, you don't want to let go of it, you should respond to it. So you prioritize the things that you can use the same metrics we did earlier, which is ease of response. If it's very easy to respond to, then maybe an earlier team member should do it and they should reserve the harder response for you later. If it is generalizable, then maybe that means it's a really applicable argument. And so the judge might believe it a lot and so on and so forth. So you want to think about kind of the way that you prioritize and select clashes in the first place and use it to apply here. Is it okay to not rebut the case that does not weigh anything in the debate? I mean, I guess, yeah. If they just like, our case is this, and then they just blabber for five minutes. You don't have to respond to it. Like one of the, I think one of the explicit things mentioned in the manual is that teams don't have to respond to everything. It's not like tabula rasa where the judge accepts things at face value. Um, you can just let the judge assume something is bad, assuming it doesn't meet the threshold um, necessary to meet the burden of proof to prove a conclusion. Can you tell us a bit more about how you usually structure your classes, clashes? Uh, I think that, that that's, a, that's a big question because it differs. I have, there's an external structure, which is I prioritize things in kind of like an onion-like fashion, which is 
the most engaged uh, sorry the the least engaging issue to the most engaging issue because it like it makes me it, it just looks good and it's also just easier to understand like this is untrue but even if you believe this is true here's a second clash even if you believe don't believe that is true here's a third clash even if you don't believe that is true here's a fourth clash and then so on and so forth here's a fourth argument and then i structure externally my material like that because i want it to always seem like to the judge that i'm being as charitable as possible so if you start from an early position of charity it may seem harder to swallow later benefits that are less charitable or more aggressive less engaging internally i structure my clashes by just first going through stating just flagging what i want to prove then first going premises that are obviously true and everyone agrees with then i will analytically link that to the conclusion you know just what are the reasons that these true premises bring us to the conclusion that we have and then explaining why this clash is important that's always very important you always want to ask so what after you've proven something to be true because if you don't have an answer for that then there's just clearly a problem because you don't you haven't put enough thought as to why your argument is important okay i think that's all of the backlog um for that person who asked uh who said they had to go to dinner yeah i hope you have a good dinner uh in general like good if people have nice dinners uh it's also hit an hour already so I'm not going to keep you in here for any longer. Don't feel any shame if you have to leave because your family is looking at you weirdly from the dining table. Um, but yeah, I'm out of questions. So if no one else has anything, I will dip.